I'm yeah. worried to go with that question. Right. So, uh, you got a little bit of freedom, a little bit of black, a little bit of whatever they have. That's the big thing you have. So the, the professor has learned about sponsorship. There's going to be a lot of society for people. Yeah. I'm sure there are people who don't get <laughs> Yeah, those that don't really know genetics really well can't handle it. Yeah. Well, they're just like vested in being one thing or another. Yeah. I did a DNA run on myself, but it got so far out mm -hmm. that the relevance was. That was, that was the John Denver gene. Yeah. Obscure jokes. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. Tom is in. I wanted to let you know, remind you that we have science expeditions coming up next Friday, Saturday, Sunday, April 14th, 15th, and 16th. And you can get the schedule for that at science.wisc.edu slash science hyphen expeditions. Uh, some cool stuff coming in. Today, we have Samantha back. Samantha, I get to ask you the five questions I ask everybody. You can answer in any way that you would like. It doesn't have to be true. It just has to be believable. We're not even sure about that last part. Samantha, where were you born? Um, in South Africa. Where in South Africa? In a small town called Peter Maritzburg, but I grew up in Cape Town. Very good. And then where'd you go to what we call high school? Uh, at a high school named Westerford in Cape Town. Very nice. And how is Cape Town this time of year? Um, beautiful. It's uh, fall there at the moment, and there are a lot of vineyards, so all of the leaves are turning in the vineyards. And yeah, that's why I go to vineyards. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are other reasons too, but those are December. And then, where'd you go for your uh, undergrads? Uh, to a place called Stellenbosch University, which is even deeper in the vineyards. And South Africans. Uh, have a drinking age of 18 and uh, a university sure age of 18. Good, good. So um, a lot of my education was in the vineyards. Did you study enology? I didn't, no. I studied um, international relations. Very good. And you call that Stell and Bosch? Yes. So that's in uh, Afrikaans means something in the woods? Um, yes, it's named after one of the first governors of the Western Cape, which is the province, Simon van der Stel, okay. and in the woods, I guess. Very good. And then did you go for graduate school places? Um, I started grad school in Stellenbosch, uh, and then I got fed up and moved to Korea for a couple of years. Good. And instead. what brought you to Madison? I met my husband in Korea, and he's American, so uh, he dragged me here to the tundra, and I'm cold all the time. <laughs> so how's the ice fishing? Um, I've, I've actually never been ice fishing. <laughs> I mean, wait, wait, just believable, right? Not true. It's, it's great. It's fantastic. <laughs> Good. Good. Your humor there. Oh, the South African humor is outstanding. <laughs> okay, so do you get to talk with us about All of Us Research Program today? I am talking about the All of Us Research Program today. We've got a couple of um, questions that we're going to look at um, from a very basic perspective, which is outlined here. What very is good. the All of Us Research Program? What are our goals and values? Um, taking a look from the pers participant is perspective. Is there any way you can get rid of that bar across the top there? That's a good question. Um, there. Just have to be able to see it from this angle. Good. There we go. Oh, you got Francis. Oh, there now. I'm ahead. Great. Uh, let's welcome Samantha to play. Well, thank you very much for having me, everybody. Um, as I was just sharing, I'm going to talk a little bit about what our goals and values are as the All of Us Research Program. And then get, share a little bit from a pers participant perspective. I'm a participant myself. Um, and then also share from a researcher perspective what data we have access to, you know, what's going on in the program, a couple of things there. And then also just about the All of Us ecosystem. I'm with UW, but you'll see that it's a much 
larger projects than than just the UW or even just Wisconsin. So diving right in, um, the All of Us Research Program is a longitudinal effort to gather data from a million or more people to accelerate, accelerate research and improve health. Um, the idea is taking all the different factors that contribute to different health outcomes, gathering data and understanding them better all together. And it's part of the Precision Medicine Initiative from the National Institutes of Health, um, which is, it's huge. It's very interesting. And the aim of that is to treat people more of, as individuals when it comes to healthcare, rather than offering those blanket solutions that I think are quite frustrating and most of us have dealt with at one point or another. So the idea is that this massive mega data project can answer a couple of really interesting questions like how can we prevent chronic pain? How may, may we potentially stop different kinds of dementia or maybe develop different treatments for diabetes? There are so many questions. In fact, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. There are over 4,300 questions already being asked of the data. So what's our mission? It's not just gathering data and then giving it, tying it up in a bow and giving it to researchers. It's actually a lot deeper than that. And you'll see right at the top, we have nurturing relationships. And that's really intentional part of having participants as partners in the All of Us Research Program. So the idea is that it's it's a relationship where we're not just taking it's a it's a bi-directional relationship where we return information back on an individual level we're also trying to deliver the largest richest um biomedical research source ever and making sure that it is really really diverse that's what that's one of the things that we mean by largest and richest um we have biobanks we we have uh, there's a british biobank that has a similar number of people, but the diversity is just not there. So when we're looking at baseline health data, we don't account for a lot of the variances that we see in the population today. We also wanna catalyze the robust ecosystem of researchers and funders that are really interested in doing the research. What I, th I think many of you will probably understand the uh, challenges of creating a cohort of research participants, especially to gather the same data that a lot of other researchers are already gathering. So we're kind of uh, combining a lot of that. And then also building and maintaining a strong all of us team. So our ecosystem, we are very intentional about creating the diversity in our team, making sure that the team is strong, that we're, um, attracting very good minds, making sure that people understand the process of, of all the different puzzle pieces within the ecosystem and are specialists in what they do. So why, why this, why now? Um, first of all, the, the technologies have evolved. We're at a place where we've got 20 plus years of electronic health record data and we have the computing capacity to crunch that data. Another thing is we have more people that are actually engaged in their own health in terms of electronic health records, but also things like our Fitbits. We're engaged in tracking our own health through devices like that. And also we have a better understanding of human genes. It's not a complete understanding yet, and we're hoping to get closer to that, but we do have a better understanding. So, so the timing is right to have all these different puzzle pieces that fit into all of us to create something like this and really catalyze a huge change in healthcare. So how will it lead to discoveries? Basically, the idea is that participants share data, we protect the data, and researchers study the data. As researchers are studying the data, participants are also getting information returned. 
And then researchers can share their discoveries and affect different healthcare providers. So there's a puzzle piece that I'm not talking about today, and that's going to be the doctors and healthcare professionals, the, the healthcare providers. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but we do have people in our ecosystem that are more specialized in that. So there are some innovative things that are different about all of us from other um, research uh, programs. I mentioned it already, but the diversity at the scale of 1 million or more people. Um, that's in terms of a lot of people who've been previously underrepresented in biomedical research. And then we also have a diversity of data types. We're not just collecting samples, we're collecting clinical, environmental, genetic, behavioral, and socioeconomic data. Um, we've, we've about a year ago rolled out a new survey about the social determinants of health, which is a whole different aspect to um, other things that we've studied in the past. Oh, sorry. We focus on participants as partners. Um, we'll, we'll get to the participant experience a little bit later. Um, and this is also a national open resource for all. So it's very different for researchers because we have public level data available for very basic research. And it's free or low cost for um, anybody who has the right data use agreement. So that really that that really reduces the cost and the level of some of the barriers to access for uh, historically underrepresented researchers, not just historically underrepresented participants. That means that the questions that we can start to ask might come from a different lens or perspective. So I mentioned before, I am a participant myself. And uh, what does that look like? There are a couple of things written up here about what the NIH promises to participants, but I thought that I would share with you myself how it goes. So I joined the All of Us Research Program because I have a history of stroke in my family. Um, my grandmother had a stroke at the age of 57, and my mother has had two strokes. Um, she is 74 now. She just turned 74. Um, and the thing that we all have in common is migraine. So I'm really curious to understand how the female line in my family have experienced migraine. I have an aunt that experiences migraine but hasn't had any strokes. And I'm curious to see how that, how those conditions are linked, if there is any link, and allow researchers access to my genes and my information about lifestyle and environment to see if there's a correlation. So that's why I decided to join the All of Us Research Program. So I'm I'm looking forward to the chance to learn about my own health. I haven't yet received the, um, the uh, health-related return of results, but I'm really looking forward to understanding more about that. So it says here, one of the things that we do is an opportunity to improve the health of future generations. Now, I don't have children, um, but I have plenty of nieces and nephews that share my DNA. And I'm interested in creating a world where my 0.01% of shared, of, of um, changed DNA that not everybody shares but me and my relatives share. I'm interested in making sure that that's represented as we look at all the different genes that are possible for humans to have. It's also a chance to learn about my own health. I've learned about my ancestry and my earwax texture, which is kind of cool, I guess. Um, but I'm looking forward to health-related return of results too. And it's an opportunity to learn about other research opportunities. So in my dashboard, I'll show you a little bit later, I can see what research opportunities are available to me because researchers can reach out through the dashboard to different cohorts for more information. Um, so it's a long-term relationship and the values to participants and researchers is right at the beginning right now. So this is how 
the sign up process goes first you create an account it's all online so you can create an account on joinallofus.org and then you go through a consent process and that consent process is do you want to participate first of all then do you want to do you agree to share your electronic health records which i have to mention i'll talk about privacy uh two or three slides from now um so it's it's consent to participate consent to share electronic health records and then there's a consent to use dna um which is the third step and that's how we decide um how to get your DNA results back to you and then answer some health surveys and have your measurements taken so there's only one clinic site visit and at that clinic site visit we take height weight blood pressure and give a blood and urine sample and then you get $25 which is always nice for a, a weekend um so what's really interesting about this process is you can see through all of the different steps what information we are accessing about an individual and that is through the surveys we understand lifestyle issues through um the urine sample that's how we understand environment well we understand a little bit through surveys and a little bit through urine because the urine sample shows a lot of uh, environmental toxins so that's one environmental factor and then and then the social determinants of health survey show other environmental factors then the dna we get from a blood sample or if you're unable to give a blood sample we do a saliva sample um and then the health records track from as soon as a health, an electronic health record was created, there's a longevity in that to see what conditions are developing, what treatments you're undergoing, what specialists you're interacting with. So all of that information looks at how lifestyle, environment, and genes, which are three major building blocks of health, interact for those different health outcomes. So that's how a lot of researchers are putting together those weighted scores of polygenic risk factors. Um, that's a huge part of what many of our 4,300 research pro, pro, uh, studies are on. So this is actually a, a screenshot of my dashboard. Um, it's not interactive, otherwise I'd show it to you a little bit better. But you can see over here, there's a dashboard this is the only place where my personal information is linked to my sample number. So my electronic health records, my um, survey answers, and my DNA sample are all linked in the researcher workbench, but that is not associated with me. The only time I ever find the only time it's ever linked any of that that information is linked is in my own dashboard in the thing that only I can log into. So um, that's where you answer survey questions, go through um, go, go through the consenting process and everything. And what I've captured here is my data. So you can see I have access to some DNA results, uh, some measurements from my in-person visit some health records, which is what my doctors are uploading to my health records. So I can see what people know about me, what um, researchers have access to about me and all of my survey answers. So if I forget what I actually put down, then I can go back and check. So privacy is one of the biggest concerns that I hear about. I'm gonna pause here and see if there are any questions about privacy. Does anyone have a question that they want to share? Yeah. Can the police get a document? Somebody calls them a warrant. Nope. So that's actually a great question. We have a certificate of confidentiality that we act that we put in place before we recruited our first participant. So our samples can't be subpoenaed 
for any reason. Um, we also have, uh, before the, this was put in place, we also made sure that there was the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, which means that health insurance companies um, and employers are not allowed to discriminate based on any genetic information that they have about you. Um, so that's that's some of the the security measures that we have. It's a subpoena prohibition and tested in a court case. I'm not sure. I I can find out and let you know. Um. So a couple of other things that we have in place, there are, there's that those two legal questions, the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act and the Certificate of Confidentiality that we have. Then there's the physical separation of the two major um, sources of information that we have. So Vanderbilt holds all of our electronic records. Then the Mayo Clinic, holds all of the physical samples. So physically, they're separated by a couple of hundreds of miles, a uh, thousand or over a thousand miles. Um, then we also, the, those electronic health records are also, um, their data is encrypted really with really strong encryptions. And the way that it's encrypted is um, similar to the National Security Agency, I believe. So they have similar le levels of, of protection and encryption for their storage of, of information. Um, we also have a team of white knight hackers whose sole responsibility it is to try and hack into our database and uh, expose any weaknesses in the encryption. Yeah. Can your companies see anonymized individual data or no. can they only see like aggregate data for the whole population? Um, they can see aggregate data, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you about the tiers of data access that, um, that people have uh, when we talk about researchers. So I will get to your question in a minute. Um, another, another issue with about researchers is you'll see it says here, researchers must agree to a code of conduct before accessing the data. One of the great things to me, one of the things that put my mind at ease was that I know researchers can um, promise to do things and agree to a code of conduct and then do something else. But the way that the All of Us re uh, database works is that researchers can never extract raw data. So the workbench itself, they have to learn a programming language, either R or Python, and they have to learn a programming language to work entirely in the data set, and they can extract answers, but they can never extract raw data. And every move in the workbench is tracked. So our independent review board has access to understanding how those researchers are moving within our, our um, raw data, which is anonymized um, to various degrees. Uh, we take out all HIPAA protected information and then the 18 identifiers of HIPAA protected. So things like your name, your social security number, your age, if it's less than a cohort of 8,000, you know, those kinds of protections. Um, and researchers aren't allowed to backtrack to find an individual. They're only allowed to ask questions about different groups and process the data inside our workbench. So they can build a cohort and then send a message to the cohort asking if they'd be willing to participate in further studies, but they can't, they don't know who that cohort is because they're not contacting individuals. They're contacting a cohort. Um, you can also withdraw at any time and our withdrawal process is quite thorough. Um, your 
data gets scrubbed from our system and your samples get destroyed. So obviously any research that has happened until that point is done. We can't unresearch something. But at that point, when you withdraw, you will never be used for future studies. Um, and then if there's a data breach of any kind, the All of Us Research Program is committed to informing everybody. So there's complete transparency with any data breaches that may happen. So there are a lot of protections in place. It's not a completely... A uh, sealed system, but it is as strong as we can possibly make it. Um, so obviously there is never a zero threat. There is an above zero threat, but it's as low as it can be. Any other questions on security? All right, I don't see any in the chat either. So all that is from the, the, partic the participant perspective. As a participant, I appreciate that my data seems to be pretty secure. Um, but from a researcher perspective, what's going on? What's happening for researchers? So the, the main draw for researchers is this offers the time and resources to accelerate resource research because we already have this huge data set. So by, by developing a, a data set of a million people, we're able to see those mega data patterns emerging that we've never really been able to see before, but we're also able to see those super niche things that are literally one in a million. Um, it's also a, a longitudinal data set that follows participants as they move move and age through their electronic health records. And we update um, surveys about once or twice a year. It's also data that's already cleaned and curated. So the um, informatics team are wizards at understanding insurance codes and making sure that electronic health records um, as the it's called SNOMED, but I can't remember what the acronym stands for. It's like a standard um, way of, of coding medical diseases and, and things, conditions and, and, and treatments. Um, so the data set is very clean, um, very uniform. Um, and then we've got fantastic data crunching tools and also participants. I can't emphasize enough how having participants is helpful for re how much having participants is helpful for this kind of research. Um, and then the ability to share workspaces and analyze with different um, research partners across the country. Um, so I, I said earlier, we have different tiers of access. There is a public tier to the data set, and that contains all the all the all the survey questions, all the um, measurements and conditions, but one at a time. So you can go into the public data browser, you and I, we don't need to sign in or anything, and say, how many people belong to all of us? and have sickle cell anemia. And the all, of us, the, the all of Us database will churn it out and say, this many people. So that's our public tier. You can ask questions one at a time on our public tier. You can't cross tabulate on our public tier because that would enable people who are not registered to narrow people down to identify them more easily. So that's a protection that we have is to be able to cross tabulate anything, you must have a data use agreement. And that's where you, you fall into the registered tier. So the registered tier is a data set um, where you do have individual level data, but you have to be approved to, um, to access it. 
And that also includes data from electronic health records. Um, we do have a Fitbit sharing um, part of the, the research program, um, surveys and physical measurements that were taken at the time of participant enrollment. And then there's the controlled tier where uh, we have, we're doing whole genome sequencing on the controlled tier. So you have to ha go through an IRB process to get into the controlled tier. Um, so everything uh, on the registered tier or the controlled tier, to get a to the registered tier, at the moment you need to belong to an institution that has a data use agreement in place, which already usually means that your institution has an independent review board for research. So there are a couple of cool things that um, researchers have access to. It's electronic health records, surveys, physical measurements, biosamples, and wearables and digital apps. The recent big news on the wearables and digital apps is that uh, we've just released, we've just worked with Fitbit to be able to understand sleep information. And sleep information is critical for so many different conditions. Um, there's actually a study that somebody at UW is using the, the data set for that looks at sleep and Alzheimer's disease. So understanding sleep better, we can understand other conditions better too. This is what is in our data set right now. There are six 120,000 participants who've completed initial consents. Um, 432,000 of those um, have gone through all of the surveys and everything. There are 360,000 electronic health records and some of that we're missing because of people moving around or not having access to their electronic health records. And 447,000 biosamples. So we're, we're still working through uh, that genome-wide sequencing of all 447,000 of those. Where are they from? Uh, in Wisconsin, we have 24,140 or 5.58% of the people enrolled in um, the research study. You can see California has got a, a fair number over there, around 60,000. Um, but yeah, you can see that every state has is represented. Every state has a couple of participants at least. So California has only sixty thousand. Yeah. The population is seven times that of Wisconsin. Right. So we're better. We're more highly represented than California. Right. Uh, proportionally, yes. So the way that the um, the National Institutes of Health have asked us to recruit is they've actually given Wisconsin the target of 100,000 participants, even though our state is relatively small. Um, and that's because we're trying, we have goals of making sure that 80% of the people who join are from groups that are underrepresented in biomedical research, and at least 50% are from racial and ethnic minorities. So if we look around in Wisconsin, we know that uh, the racial and ethnic minorities are maybe not the, um, the dominant population group in Wisconsin. But if we look at underrepresented in biomedical research, there are a couple of categories that I've highlighted up here. People who are over the age of 65 are often arbitrarily left out of research studies for various reasons, especially in clinical trials. Uh, people who live in rural areas are, a lot of researchers have a lot of barriers to allowing people in rural areas to access research studies. So we're trying to change that. And that's why Wisconsin was chosen as some as a state to, repre to represent 10% of the database. Um, and then low socioeconomic status. Um, we have a lot of people in Wisconsin that meet those three criteria, which is why we've been asked for such a huge portion of us to actually participate in this study. 
Um, and then racial and ethnic minorities, sexual and gender minorities, and people with disabilities all form a part of this 80% uh, of people who are underrepresented in biomedical research. Um, and so far, we're actually hitting those targets in those 620,000 participants. We're, we're about matched with the 50% the uh, racial and ethnic minorities and the 80% underrepresented. Um, so what our research is doing right now, uh, we have over 5,000 researchers that are registered, um, at least registered tier, some of those are controlled tier. There are 430, so, sorry, 4,370 th active projects. And if you look at those, if you break that down a little bit, it's 313 with cancer in the title, 28 with Alzheimer's and 25 with dementia in the, the title, 123 projects using GWAS or genome-wide association study in title. And you can actually, the, this is a, a website that's open to the public. And one of the reasons that being a participant is kind of cool is you can read through all the studies and flag any that you think might not work for you or your community. So historically, research projects have have uh, highlighted um, certain communities in a way that was unflattering to the community or um, led to prejudiced outcomes for the community. So this is a way that um, the All of Us Research Program is working on making sure that if you're represented in this massive data set, you have access to be a reviewer of the projects that are using your data. If you think, you know, actually, I don't think it's fair that this study exists, or I think that this might show things about my community that I don't like or agree with, you can flag it for follow-up. Um, and then the review board will go through a review process to see if the, the um, project can be done in a different way that doesn't discriminate or lead to discrimination, or if it's something that should be scrapped entirely. Um, and then we look at Oh, this is a, an example that I put up here of one of the questions is machine learning based gen genome wide association study. And uh, the abstract says, I intend to develop novel machine learning based approaches for identifying genetic variants associated with human traits. I hypothesize that these new approaches will be a valuable sus supplement to existing tools, allowing researchers to study complex gene to gene and gene to environment interactions and that's quite uh that's quite typical there are a lot of polygenic risk studies um that are going that are part of these um 400 and 4,370 I can read numbers I swear 4,370 active projects and then we also look at um the 130 plus publications that are using all of us data already so where do we fit? Um, I've been talking today a little bit about some of the researchers and the participant experience. I'm part of the University of Wisconsin, which is in the uh, healthcare provider organizations and networks. So that's um, HPOs that have clinical and scientific expertise. That includes a lot of universities too. Um, but we also have a data and research center that is responsible for cleaning up that data set. The biobank at the Mayo Clinic, um, which is our, our repository and they process all of our DNA samples. We've got the Participant Technology Systems Center who run the dashboard that I showed you um, where I, I access my own information. Genomics Partners, which is um, at the moment we have uh, Color, which is an, an organization that does genetic counseling, because as we return information back to participants, um, you learn about your own health and sometimes that's upsetting. Sometimes there are things in your genes that are 
um, that predict or have a predisposition, not predict, have a predisposition to different health outcomes and you need more information as to your next steps. So we actually have genomic partners to help you understand that as participants. Then um, there's a, a participant network. I'm gonna, excuse me. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then there's us, the health providers, and then there's a communications and engagement network, which is why you've probably seen uh, all of us banners at baseball games and on TV and those kinds of things. We have a national communications partner. Um, where do we fit in Wisconsin? Um, oh, I thought I deleted that slide. Um, we are part of a, we're part of a consortium, which is that little piece over there, the Wisconsin Consortium. You can see the little UW over here. So it's vast. All of us is huge. There are a lot of people working in a lot of states about, um, on the All of Us Research Program. And we in Wisconsin are partnered with Gunderson Health, which is mostly based out of La Crosse. Uh, we're with the uh, Medical College and Freydert in Milwaukee, and we also have a UW site in Milwaukee. Then uh, Marshfield Clinic up north in Marshfield and all the way up to the Northwoods. And then it's us. So that's where we sit um, within the All of Us Consortium. And with that, do you have any questions? Uh, sure. Yeah, I have a question. I have patients who brought in with the PA working in Chicago feeding mostly in immigrants, which has about a 50% Spanish speaking population. And this is a big system, so they see several hundred thousand uh, patients in a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people that go through there uh, show up a few times, some for many years, but uh, some. Just occasionally, they have all kinds of medical problems, lots of them. And are you able to catch a population like that? And what are they worth if you can follow them for maybe three months or three years? Is that not compatible with the whole model that you're developing? Right. Um, I'll share a little bit about myself too in that context um, to preface my answer. I'm an immigrant. Um, I have an electronic health record in this country that dates back five years since I first arrived. Um, I'm a member of all of us because those five years are a longitudinal uh, electronic health record study. Uh, one of the struggles of the immigrant population, especially when it comes to health, is having consistency in record keeping. So at a at a so at that kind of clinic site um, where your daughter works, if they're seeing the same people several times, there's absolutely value in that. Um, I'll also share that I moved here from Indiana. I didn't come straight to Wisconsin. My husband's a Hoosier, um, so, so upgrades. But uh, <laughs> uh, when I came here. My doctor managed to put a lot of my electronic health records from my provider in Indiana to Wisconsin. So even though um, I'm with a new provider now in a system, so in, in Madison specifically, we it's pretty easy to put records, SSN to um, UW Health, to Merita, you know, all the different systems. Um, porting across states is a little bit more difficult, but if an immigrant has motivation to have continuity in their healthcare, the technology exists for it to happen. And that's uh, courtesy of Epic, I think. Um, the Epic are working on a lot of the, um, the, health record portability and then there's also 
an international movement called Share for Science, where electronic health records are becoming more portable across international borders. So we actually have some um, participants who are Canadian by birth. And I think that's one of the first um, international portabilities that we've seen. Uh, but I don't, I don't really know very much about the informatics side of things that's responsible for the electronic health record portability. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it does. Um, as I was trying to uh, ask my daughter, you know, what they could do, and mm. uh, it came up with a big frustration with um, not being able to follow up the patients over time. And yeah. They're outside the uh, business and they're inside in the system. Right. And they didn't use that thing, so obviously it's for the bill. And, uh, mm. The I think um, another challenge with immigration is uh, the there's a, a difference in health literacy across diff the different standards of health literacy across different countries. Um, and one of the challenges would be, especially in a in a kind of permeable clinic like that, um, maybe people show up three times, but they give their first name. Uh, spelled a little differently. Um, they don't ne necessarily have a social security number yet. So they they don't have, they there may be duplicate um, records being created for the same person. So I understand the challenge. It's tough. It really is tough. Uh, we would love to have more data generated from clinics like that. And that's something that we're, we're working on as a society, but uh, I think, yeah, it's it's very difficult. Yeah. I have been a um, participant in this, I think at least five years. Um, and it was brought back to me without my offering information. You guys, your company came back to me and told me certain attributes that I have, inherited issues that I will have. Um, oh, really? I'm Scandinavian. There are a lot of us who settled in like North and South Dakota, mm -hmm. um, wandered around Minnesota, a few in Wisconsin that have a particular ailment in common. Um, I'm a cancer patient at Carbone now. Oh, cool. I've been for about a year and a half. And one of the questions I have is, I haven't been asked about that part of the development of my personal situation. Um, does Carbone, and I know they participate, I see the signs of this all over the place. Um, do, they, do they put me into your system without my doing anything? No. I haven't been asked a lot of questions for a long time. Um. Let me go back to the participant experience a little bit. Um, when we, when you share your electronic health record, um, information from Carbone or information from your doctors, oh, I. Yeah, Carbone would be a healthcare provider. So information from your doctors would then um, translate to your electronic health records. Okay. So all of us researchers would then be able to see your electronic health records, which have um, some information about your treatments at Carbone. So in that way, it's circular, but Carbone is not sharing patient information with all of us. Um, any study that you participate in at Carbone has its own set of consents. And the All of Us Research Program isn't sharing information with Carbone because we have our own set of consents. So consent is unique to each study unless you have kind of a blanket consent. And if you're signing a blanket consent, then um, any researcher that's worth anything is going to make sure that you're very well informed of that. Um, but what I wanted to show you, 
was uh, one of the things that you might be talking about, which is the genetic return of results, which is kind of a big deal at the moment in all of us research. So we are um, returning genetic information back to participants. I shared a little bit about my own genetic return of results, but um, we're also returning 59 genes that cause hereditary or have predispositions to hereditary conditions that are what we call actionable. That means you can do something lifestyle or intervention wise to change the trajectory. And there's a nice long list here of those 59 genes. So you might be able to recognize something that was shared with you. And that's the process I was talking about with genetic counselors. We estimate that about 2% of the all of us participants of the million participants will find something in their herited, uh, hereditary disease risk report. And if you find that, say, you have an RB1 gene, retinoblastoma, you can find out a little bit more about that and find out that it's a, a kind of cancer that usually develops in eyes. Or you can find out about um, the BRCA genes, which are pretty well known, um, which have hereditary breast and ovarian cancer um, risks associated. So what we know, if we have a BRCA gene, we know that you're going to want to do earlier screenings and you're gonna to want to do more regular screenings for cancer. If you go down this list a little bit more and you say, um, there's uh, a familial hypocholesterolemia, um, dangerously high cholesterol, that's gonna be a lifestyle change. So we're returning these hereditary diseases um, or the hereditary disease risk profiles back to people who, who participate. And then the other thing that we're returning is pharmacogenomics, which is something that you also might have received a report on, um, which is how drugs interact or how different medicines interact with your genes. So what we know about some medica medications is the um, there's in, in pharmacology, they have something called the mechanism of delivery and that's how it's distributed how the uh, medication is distributed through your body and for a lot of medications um, plavix is an example um, there's an enzyme associated with unlocking the gene to distribute it throughout your body and there's a gene associated that if you have the gene you lack the enzyme and 30% of people who are pre prescribed Plavix have this gene and it's just creating expensive urine. So uh, we're returning this information back to people. We also know things. Our PI is very uh, cavalier about sharing her. She's already received her um, pharmacogenomic report and she's, she's tiny. She's very short and dinky. And she'll say it will take three times the amount of anesthesia to knock her out. Um, so they have to triple her body weight to be able to properly anesthetize her. And that's based on this disease risk. So that's just an interesting um, part of, of the return of results for people who participate in all of us. And that's why you might be getting recontacted and saying, we found in your genes these different conditions and it's interesting that you're say, seeing that those are matching with your experience too is that right they are matching the okay all right sorry yes is there the actual number of people that will be allowed into this program no no we're um we're hoping for a minimum of a million um, at the moment, we're hoping to reach that goal by about 2026. Um, but we're not, we're, the future is a little uncertain because COVID set us back a few years because um, most of our recruitment methods 
or a lot of our recruitment came for, through community partnerships, which for two years we kind of shut down and, and we didn't want to risk anybody's health to participate. So we're not really sure on the timeline and the long-term impacts of COVID have still to be seen. Yes, yeah, sir. I have a question about the, the health codes that get put in by your provider in, into the record. I know um, Medicare, Medicare has something where you put in the code and they get reimbursed for what they do. Right. So the Medicare Advantage, they're like you know, capitated a certain amount per month. They get paid and then they, anything that's not spent is like profit for them. So there's this new thing called um, ACO Reach. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It used to be called direct contracting entities, where now your primary care provider is associated kind of with a essentially a, an HMO or a Medicare Advantage plan. And the plan is by 2030, everyone is put into a Medicare Advantage plan according to where their primary care provider is. And the Medicare and the amount of money they pay monthly for you, that depends on what. You know, how bad a shape you're in. So your okay. primary care provider is financially motivated to kind of upcode your conditions. So if your know, diabetes becomes diabetes with retinopathy or a, a level mm. two, whatever, becomes a level three, whatever. And so they're they have a financial incentive to make you appear in, in worse shape than you are. I'm wondering if this would, would mess up the record keeping at all. Um I really hope not. Um, well, yeah, um, I'm going to share, um, I think I stopped sharing with the Zoom participants, but this is something that I wanted to share um, in our data browser. This is, this is a really interesting part of our data browser to me is uh, those diagnostic codes that we we're talking about. In the data browser on a public level, uh, people who understand way more about medical concepts than me can come to our data browser and put in a keyword word, like you said, diabetes. Diabetes. Mm, now I've got caps lock on. I'm not illiterate, I swear. Hmm. No, that's, I'm searching in the wrong spot. Um, conditions, there it is. So you can see the top 10, um, the top 10 conditions that we've got recorded. And then you can also search pain is the, the top with 180,000 people reporting pain of the 620,000. So you can find in our data browser, you can see the top 10 types of diabetes reported. And you can look at each one with a little bit more um, detail and see uh, diabetes, uh, type two diabetes, type two diabetes mellitus without complication, um, hyperglycemia due to diabetes, and then that can break down into things like sex assigned at birth and age. Um, so yeah, those are, this is a look at the coding, um, that we see. And I think what you're asking has a somewhat to do with what, what I'm talking about here, which is, is a condition going to be made more complex to go into our data set? Judgment in many cases, right? What category put you in, and when they have a financial incentive to make you mm -hmm. that might, yeah, just, just change the, the composition of the data from what used to be like 20 years ago, right? Um, I, I don't really know. Um, all I know is how our data is recorded now. Um, but I wonder if that level of specificity might actually help as we're looking at the um, the different reports through electronic health records? I don't know, it's a great question. Uh, thank you for the context. I'll chat to my PI about that too. Any other questions?
Um, you mentioned COVID. What do you think long COVID may or may not do in your recipe? How you track that? Is that going to be a better example of the advantage of this? Or is it going to be a common problem? Um, I think it's really interesting that COVID happened right after we started collecting samples. And one of the interesting things that happened was we were able to find COVID in serology samples before we actually knew it was in the United States through the All of Us Research Program. Serology is in the blood or Yeah, or... yeah. Um, I think just the hemoglobins. Uh, I'll have to double check on that, um, find that report somewhere. Uh, but... Um, the effect of, of COVID on long COVID on our samples, um, I think that that's something that we're able to see. We do also have um, additional surveys, which I think are in here, which were, uh, we call them the COPE survey. That's the um, COVID participant experience survey. And um, we did two participant experience surveys. Um, so you can check out in our data browser and I'll link the data browser. I'll, um, let me send you the Zoom link into the data browser that you can then distribute to everybody. Um, but you can see there were over 100,000 participants in our first COVID survey and that happened in 2020. Um, you can see the, the experiences, whether or not people had COVID or COVID-like symptoms, um, related testing, did you have COVID tests? Um, and uh, that that is also an interesting question to me because when I had COVID, I wasn't in the country, I was outside of the country, so it never went on my medical records. But when I came back, I had a sore throat for over a month. So I went to my doctor and I reported that I had been diagnosed with COVID outside of the country. So that did go on my medical records. So it's just an interesting, a lot of people had those rapid tests at home. So COVID hasn't entered their medical records or EHRs yet. Um, so we did ask questions. That's why we put out these surveys is uh, to find out people's experiences with COVID um whether or not people were testing uh how stressful social distancing was or um isolation measured um and like the impact of covid um you can see one of the questions here in the past 7 days i felt watchful or on guard there's a lot of anxiety i had trouble concentrating um health basics do you know like any different health conditions that you've got that might be comorbidities, um, general well-being, social support, stress. You know, these are all different survey questions that we asked with relation to COVID. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, it's a hard question. You responded, and it's going to be very interesting to see what this new database allows us to see and detect. Um, and you're clearly looking at it. For sure. Let me just share that to our Zoom chat as well. Uh, so that everyone can have a look. That's a great question. Um, they happen. There are um, is, a, is a participant allowed to challenge something that's in the medical record? That's between you and your provider. Um, that's not a, that we don't. So one of the challenges for us is that um, we, the, the electronic health record data is one directional. We will never put anything on people's electronic health records. And that's for a reason, because um, research study participation can lead to different um, like forms of discrimination because doctors will or um, providers will eventually know what information you're re receiving back from the All of Us Research Program. So we're never going to tell your doctor through your health record that you're participating. 
we won't upload any of your um, hereditary disease risks or anything like that because we don't want to um, uh, uh, give them the give them any information before the time um, that they make the diagnosis. All of our information that we return to people are research results and not medical results. And that has implications for life insurance, long-term care insurance, and disability insurance, because those three types of insurance are able to ask for um, electronic health records or medical records. But this research is not a medical diagnosis. So for that reason, we're not putting any information on your medical records. So we can't change anything from our end, that would be up to the participant to, to have a conversation with their provider about what's going on their records. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, any other questions? I'm yes. curious if, if the, the databases are um, kind of usable by, by our, our students that are in kind of an intermediate or advanced statistics course. Absolutely. Okay. Um, what level uh, they have access to? depends on um, whether or not the institution that they're studying at has a data use agreement. But I'll show you um, the, the, no, here, the researcher workbench. That's what I'm looking for. The researcher workbench is um, how stats students, probably where they'd be the most interested. And we have workspaces where you have to go through an application. Oh, no, we don't want the video. You'd have to go through an application, oh. sorry, go through an application to create a workspace. Um, then you can see all of the different tools that we've got here. We've got a cohort builder. I think this is fascinating. I love the cohort builder, um, data set builder um, to kind of create those cross tabulation analyses. Uh, but the public work, the, the the public browser um you're not going to be able to cross tabulate anything it's just a like single information one chunk of information at a time and uh that's disaggregated by um i think gender and age mostly and some of them have um disaggregation by race but not a lot you have to get a no no, you don't. In fact, um, we only have about uh, 12,880 participants that have shared their Fitbit information. And that's really useful because you can see heart rate um, by zone, like by exercise zone, um, activity. And we've just released, it's not on this website yet, um, sleep information. So it's really valuable for researchers if you do, but if you don't have one, it's fine. Great. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everybody. Um, one more thing. Uh, it would be most wonderful if all of you would participate in all of us. We are... Um, it is quite easy to join and I would love to have anyone who's interested chat to me after this and um, yeah, uh, let me know if you're interested in signing up. I have some more information in my bag. I've got some pens for everybody as well if you want. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thanks.